Welcome to the Fiber Cell Systems mini webinar, Production of Difficult to Express Proteins and Monoclonal Antibodies in Hollow Fiber Bioreactors. I'm John Cadwell. I hope to challenge some of the notions you may have regarding two dimensional flask culture and show how high density three dimensional culture in a hollow fiber bioreactor is a more in vivo like and better way to grow cells. Fiber Cell Systems has been providing laboratory scale hollow fiber bioreactors since the year 2000. Please visit our website, www.fibercellsystems.com, for more information. Here we have cell culture through the ages. I call this my James Michener approach. We can look at the first attempts to culture cells in vitro, i.e. meaning in Latin, under glass or outside of the body, by Harrison in 1906, who cultured frog neuronal explants on plasma clots. We can see a plasma clot is a three-dimensional porous cell culture support. Many years passed and it wasn't until the development of proteolytic enzymes in the 50s and laminar flow hoods in the 70s for cell culture to become the ubiquitous technique that it is today. And in this case, we're using non-porous plastic flasks in a two-dimensional way to culture cells. And if we want to scale them up, we just need more surface area. There's many ways to do this, multiple layer flasks or roller bottles. But all of these techniques utilize the culture of cells as a monolayer, which is inherently non-physiologic, on a non-porous two-dimensional support, which is also non-physiologic, and in the presence of fetal bovine serum, which is also inherently non-physiologic. The only time that cells will see serum is when they're in an activated state, i.e. the clotting factors have been removed. So this is a combination of ways to culture cells that is inherently non-physiologic. All flask-based cell culture methods lead to what we call the feast or famine cycle, which indicates that cells are in a constant state of change. We first see the cells and we undergo what we call the lag phase. This is while the cells are attaching to the plastic and they're also secreting their own cytokines to support their growth. They are working to develop their own microenvironment, even though they're in the presence of fetal bovine serum. Glucose is consumed, lactate is produced, and then we have a short window opportunity where the cells are at their optimum conditions for producing proteins or monoclonal antibodies. Just when things are getting good, it's time to split the cells and repeat the whole process again. So the cells are in a constant state of changing cell culture conditions and are maintained at their optimum cell culture conditions for only a short period of time in the total cell culture cycle. So wouldn't it be nice, isn't it desirable, if we could have a way of culturing cells that would maintain them at their optimum cell culture conditions for extended periods of time. In point of fact, that's exactly what we do with a hollow fiber bioreactor. A hollow fiber bioreactor is based on the principle that each one of these little hollow fibers is like a little filter shaped like a drinking straw. You pot it in the ends of a plastic shell so that anything that ends, enters the end of the cartridge necessarily goes to the insides of the fiber. And we typically culture the cells on the outside of the fiber. So what this means is that we've set up a semi-permeable barrier of defined molecular weight cutoff between where the media is flowing and the cells are growing. Media is constantly recirculating through the insides of the fiber to provide nutrients and gas support and to remove CO2 and waste products. Hollow fiber bioreactors are fundamentally different in three ways from standard flask culture. First, we have an extremely high surface area to volume ratio that permits the culture of cells of very high densities, typically one to two times 10 to the eight cells per mil. It's the only way to grow cells at in vivo-like cell densities. It's this high cell density that allows the cells to generate their own microenvironment. Our medium-sized cartridge, the C2011, has 4,000 square centimeters of surface area in a volume of only 20 mils. So we have 200 square centimeters of surface area per milliliter volume. So you can imagine the film that's 50 microns thick. This extremely high surface area to volume ratio is what allows us to grow cells at in vivo-like cell densities. Secondly, the cells are bound to a porous support, not a non-porous two-dimensional flask. With regular flask culture, nutrients come from the top down. When the cells become multi-layered, bottom layer of cells don't get nutrients and oxygen, so they die and peel off and float away. Hollow fiber bioreactors, the nutrients come from the bottom up. This allows the cells to grow in multiple layers and allows them to grow in a post-confluent multi-layer fashion. 
This means that we never have to split the cells in a hollow fiber bioreactor and passage number is irrelevant. We've cultured the hybridoma for up to a year of continuous culture in one of our hollow fiber bioreactors. Thirdly, the molecular weight cutoff of the fiber is anywhere from 5,000 Daltons up to 0.1 microns. So keep in mind that a Dalton is the mass of a hydrogen atom. Kilodalton is 1,000 Daltons. The average mass of amino acid is around 120. So if we have something like an IgG with a molecular weight of 147,000 Daltons or 147 kD, we can look at it and see that it's comprised of about 1,200 amino acids. So what the molecular weight cutoff does is allow small things like glucose and lactate to freely cross the fiber, while larger molecules like antibodies, pro other proteins, viruses, extracellular vesicles, parasites, bacteria, etc., cannot cross the fiber and will remain trapped to very high concentrations in an area outside the fiber, inside the bioreactor we call the ECS or extracapillary space. This is a schematic of the hollow fiber cartridge from fiber cell systems. We don't use a peristaltic pump. We utilize a positive pressure displacement pump that squeezes on this tubing with two one-way check valves in order to generate the flow rate. This recirculation rate can be as high as 160 mils a minute. Media recirculates through the insides of the fiber. Cells are grown on the outside of the fiber. Nutrients and waste products frost across the fiber. And then we can harvest our concentrated product from the ECS just by moving into the laminar flow hood and utilizing syringes to harvest our product. So we use this positive pressure displacement pump so that we don't have any friction or wearing on the pump tubing. This is why we can culture our cartridges for up to a year or longer continuous culture. It's a closed system. Silicone tubing is there to provide gas exchange surface area. And it is a closed biosafe system that can be used for culturing pathogenic bacteria and other types of biohazardous material. This is just a fun little schematic that shows you how the cartridge is assembled. Potting material is here where the fibers are potted into the end of the cartridge. This is the loop of silicone tubing where the gas exchange takes place. Two one-way check valves are in the back of the cartridge here. And here's our pump tubing that the duet pump squeezes on to generate the flow rate. The fiber cell duet is a brushless servo-controlled motor designed to not generate heat or produce ozone in the incubator, and it's designed to fit inside any standard sized incubator. Gas is controlled by the incubator, temperature is controlled by the incubator. We wanted this to be a very simple system, easy to use. I have a thin cord for power designed to fit right through the door of the incubator. The cartridge is designed to be removed easily from the pump and moved into the laminar flow hood. Keep in mind that it is both the easiest and the hardest thing to contaminate when it's outside of the hood. It is totally sealed. When you move it into the hood, we're going to start to work with the laminar flow hood and the ports being open. So good sterile technique is always a plus. Remember that Pasteur was correct. Life does not spontaneously generate. Maintenance only takes 15 minutes a day. You just need to take the cartridge out. We're going to measure the glucose and harvest our product. The total amount of glucose in the media tells us when it's time to change the media. We like working with high glucose media with high density cell culture. So typically this means we'll work with DMEM, which has 4.5 grams of glucose uh, to start with. So we like to change the media when it's about 50% depleted or around two grams per liter. The rate of glucose consumed or the amount of glucose consumed in a 24 hour period of time tells us how many cells we have in the cartridge and how happy they are. Remember the difference between science and art is mathematics. Now we can put a number to our cell culture to see exactly how it's performing. So as long as the glucose uptake rate is increasing or plateauing, then we know our culture is happy. We have determined empirically that the glucose uptake rate of about a gram per day equals 10 to the 9 cells inside the cartridge. After we're finished harvesting and monitoring our glucose, we can simply take the cartridge and move it back into the pump in the incubator. Here we can just get a look 
at what uh, cells growing at 10 to the 8th per mil look like inside one of the cartridges. This is uh, hybridomas. Inside the cartridge, we see a lot of cells here because the cartridge diameter expands a little bit so that there's uh, room for the fiber potting material to not run up the size of the cartridge through capillary action. So this is what cells will look like at this kind of density, and it's kind of surprising, but even at this density at this edge of the cartridge, the cells will exhibit extremely high viability. I've directly measured this myself, and they're going to be 90% plus viable even under these conditions. So this gives you an idea of the kind of cell densities that we can achieve in a hollow fiber bioreactor with a hybridoma cell line. There are many advantages to the culturing of cells in a three-dimensional high-density hollow fiber bioreactor. The product that's secreted by the cells can be concentrated by as much as 100 times when compared to flask culture or spinner culture. Because of the microenvironment, the three-dimensional in vivo-like microenvironment of the cells, we find that we have uniform and complete post-translation modifications for extended periods of time. We've cultured a hybridoma for a year of continuous culture and see no changes in affinity, avidity, or glycosylation patterns. Also, we see reduced apoptosis, which means the cells will go necrotic, but they don't blow up and spew their guts all over the place. So we see less contamination of intracellular proteins and DNA and membrane fragments. This is especially important for people working with extracellular vesicles. And because of this constant recirculation of media and homeostatic cell culture conditions, we see consistency of production over many months of culture. Uh, because of this high cell density, we've also found that we can either reduce the amount of serum that we utilize in our media, or we have also developed our own product called CDMHD, or chemically defined media for high density culture. Several years ago, we observed that it was possible when using a hollow fiber bioreactor to more easily adapt the cells over to commercial serum-free media or to reduce the serum down to 2%. Based upon this observation, we developed a product called CDMHD, or chemically defined media for high density cell culture. CDMHD is a simplified, modified, optimized cell culture serum replacement that is designed to work in a specific microenvironment of a hollow fiber bioreactor. It contains no surfactants, it's chemically defined and protein free. It's completely CGMP compliant. With this then, you get high lot to lot consistency. It comes as a powder and you rehydrate it into one liter and sterile filter it. And you use it at 10%, just like you would fetal bovine serum. You can ship it at ambient temperature, store it at four degrees. And it's very simple to ship internationally since it contains no protein. One of the key features of CDMHD is that we find that it does not work in flask culture. Cells must be at least five times 10 to the seven cells per mil in order for CDMHD to support their culture. So CDMHD is more than just a protein-free serum replacement. It is in fact a direct manifestation of the different cell culture conditions found in a hollow fiber bioreactor. It was designed to take advantage of these conditions. This is how we find under high density cell culture conditions that the cells are able to generate their own microenvironment. We need to keep in mind that there are many different medias, specialized medias out there that have been developed for specific cell types. We find that the environment in a hollow fiber bioreactor renders differences between different medias uh, not so important. So remember in vivo, we only have one cell culture media and many different cell types. A hollow fiber bioreactor is intended to recapitulate these in vivo-like, high-density, three-dimensional cell culture conditions. Cesar Milstein received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1978 for the development of hybridoma technology, in which he takes a B cell and fuses it with a cancer cell in order to make a hybridoma monoclonal antibody. When he did this, he knew that he was making a cell that inhibits its own growth. So one of the functions of cancer cells is that they secrete a factor called TGF-beta or transforming growth factor beta, which is designed to specifically locally immune suppress and suppress the activity of B cells. So when you make a hybridoma, you make a cell that inhibits its own growth. So TGF-beta has a molecular weight of around 27,000 Daltons. So this is why we use the molecular weight cutoff that we do for hybridomas, 
because we want to allow the TGF beta to diffuse away while the antibody and the cells that secrete them remain trapped in the small volume of the extra capillary space. So by removing this TGF beta, hybridomas will grow faster and produce more antibody per cell than they will in any other culture method that does not remove the TGF beta. So we trap the antibody in, the high, in high concentrations in the extra capillary space. Uh, we can easily adapt over to our CDMACD uh, serum replacement. We have lower endotoxin. Um, concentration is typically going to be 0.5 to 5 milligrams per mil of antibody. So our C2011 cartridge will produce somewhere between 5 and 50 milligrams of antibody every two days. We'll do so for up to a year of continuous culture. So we're going to get somewhere between 5 and 100 milligrams continuous production. We also find that because of these cell culture conditions, we have proper glycosylation, and that can result in the higher affinity antibodies. And in this particular case, we can see a gel. This is not purified antibody, but this is a raw supernatant harvest that's been unpurified. Cells have been simply spun out. So we can see that under these conditions that our monoclonal antibody is the predominant product in the supernatant. And we have people who have actually been able to inject raw supernatants directly into animals with the CDMHD. There's nothing immunogenic present in CDMHD. Now, granted, this is not the most sensitive of gels, but it is a representative sample that was sent to us by Dr. Aaron Bromage at Amherst University. This is another example of a monoclonal antibody produced in our hollow fiber bioreactor utilizing CDMHD. And in this particular case, they started off with DMAM and 10% FBS and then diluted that out after a week of culture with subsequent harvest. So here we can see the BSA being removed. Um, this is a 10x concentration. You can see that the antibody is more than 10x concentrated versus flasks. Um, and they were able to produce about 400 milligrams of antibody in about five weeks utilizing our system. When it comes to recombinant protein expression, the mammalian expression system is generally to be preferred. Uh, this will give us improved solubility, correct and uni uh, uniform post-translational modifications, which will give you correct bioactivity and immuno reactivity and a longer serum half-life. So in the past, it's been difficult to express a lot of recombinant protein from mammalian expression systems simply because of the low secretory capacity of these types of cells. Hollow fiber is a way that allows you to utilize mammalian expression system and efficiently generate 10 milligrams on up to gram quantities of a recombinant protein. Here at FiberCell, we've developed our own definition for difficult to express proteins. These are proteins that are going to be highly glycosylated, require lots of post-translational modifications, uh, specifically low levels of secretion. And we have specific examples with the IL-15 receptor complex. Uh, the IL-15 receptor complex is co-expressed on the same gene. The IL-15 and its uh, associated receptor are co-expressed and secreted as a unit. Um, this protein is highly glycosylated. It's 45% carbohydrate. It's held together strictly with receptor ligand interaction forces. Um, very difficult to express. Uh, we have a researcher we work with who utilizes this in animal studies and has found that it's very difficult to express this in any other system, any other bioreactor system than the hollow fiber bioreactor. We also have found proteins such as bites, which are bispecific T cell engagers, trikes, the trispecific killer engagers. These are structures that are not found in nature. And cells have a difficult time sometimes producing these kinds of unusual amino acid sequences. And we have some data that shows that the hollow fiber bioreactors are the only way to efficiently produce some of these bispecific antibodies, structures that are difficult for the cells to secrete and produce. So we find for recombinant protein production as well, that this high density cell culture environment can engender proper subunit formation and complete and uniform post-translational modifications. In point of fact, we find the more complex the protein is, the more highly glycosylated it is, the more subunits it has, the better it can be expressed in a hollow fiber bioreactor. This is a specific example of a hexamized IgG. It's six IgG1 subunits held together with three IgA tails. It's a very complex protein when it's expressed in flask culture. You can see that 40% of it is expressed 
is an improperly folded monomeric subunit. You take these very same cells from a tissue culture flask and seed them in the fiber cell systems by a reactor cartridge, and we get 95% plus of the protein is properly assembled into its multimeric form. So we find that we can work with both suspension and adherent cell types. Uh, there's no need to adapt cells to suspension culture in order to scale up bioproduction of recombinant proteins. In fact, it's better for the cells to be stuck to the fiber because this means A, that they'll grow at higher density, and B, when we harvest our product, we'll be preferentially pulling out the dead cells. Your product will be 100 times higher concentration up to versus flask culture. <clears throat> in this particular case, for this hexamized IgG, uh, the researcher was able to produce half a gram of protein in five liters volume in a period of about 60 days. Uh, very easy to adapt again these cells to our protein-free chemically defined serum replacement CDMHD. Uh, we'll see this complete uniform post-translation modification is exhibited for many months of culture. This is an example of our hexatomized IgG. This is not, in fact, a computer-generated drawing, but an actual cryo-electron tomograph that's been colorized. And we can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six IgG1 subunits held together with one, two, three IgA tails. And what this researcher has done is replace the FV region with CD4 receptor. So he's used the antibody backbone to make a dodecaramized CD4 receptor that binds to GP120 on HIV and inactivates it. It's a very clever structural uh, engineering exercise. Here are some raw harvests, unpurified harvests from a GG44 chill cell line. I don't usually like to say, oh, look at all these dead cells, but in this particular case, cells are only about 5% viable. The researchers were doing some interesting things with media. Um, but we can see that even if we have only 5% viable cells, we get tremendous productivity. Here's our protein of interest. They were getting in the range of a milligram per mil from this DG44 Cho cell line. Here's our protein of interest. And we can see again that our secreted product is the main protein of interest in the supernatant from the cell culture harvest when using CDMHD. This is recombinant IL-12 expressed in 293 T cells. IL-12 is a cytokine, it's fairly heavily glycosylated and also contains a critical intersubunit disulfide bond that must be intact for proper function. And we need to maintain its stable native conformation. Utilizing CDMHD, we see that 25% of the total protein in the cell culture supernatant is our protein of interest, which renders purification simplified. Sometimes we can even skip a step or two in our purification protocol, which will enhance yield as well. The IL-15 receptor complex is a classic difficult to express protein. It's about 45% carbohydrate. It's two subunits that held together strictly with ligand receptor interaction. Uh, it can fall apart very easily during the production scheme. This slide demonstrates stable production of our difficult to express IL-15 receptor complex protein for over 150 days of continuous culture, as evidenced by its stable HPLC analysis profile. Keep in mind the number of flasks that might be utilized over 150 days of protein production. Just like to point out that this is a continuous production system we don't have to split the cells, it's much less labor involved, and we don't generate all this plastic waste that we can generate when we perform large-scale cell culture in the laboratory. So in summary, hollow fiber bioreactors are the method of choice for the culture of 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 11th cells. This is anywhere from 20 to 200 roller bottles worth of cells. It's ideal for producing 10 milligrams to several grams of monoclonal antibody, 10 to 100 of milligrams of recombinant proteins in a manageable volume of anywhere from 100 mils on up to just a few liters. Concentration of products is 10 to 100 times higher than with conventional methods. So this means that endotoxin burden can be reduced and that purification schemes can be rational for smaller volumes of media. 
That's the most in vivo method for culturing cells over long periods of time. So this means that we have complete and uniform post-translational modifications. We see a reduction in apoptosis, so less contamination with host cell proteins and intracellular DNA. Typical productivity is anywhere from half a mg to five milligrams per mil of a monoclonal antibody, 100 micrograms to 300 micrograms per mil per day for recombinant proteins. And it is gonna save you time, space, and purification costs. I always like to point out the fiber cell systems is an enabling supplier to NASA. We supply them with our hollow fiber modules for culture in the zero G gravity environment of the International Space Station. We have Fiber Man is equipped for his outer space journey. And we can see that historically, the first attempts at culturing cells in vitro were performed on a three-dimensional plasma clot. This evolved into two-dimensional culture methods, which are inherently non-physiologic, until finally we have the arrival of our hollow fiber bioreactors, a three-dimensional in vivo-like way of culturing cells. I want to say thank you for your time and thank you for joining me on this Fiber Cell Systems mini webinar. If you have any other questions or would like some more information, please feel free to visit our website at www.fibercellsystems.com.